So hi everyone, we're just about to get started with the webinar from the Professional Development Virtual Chapter. In a second or two I'm going to introduce myself and I'm also going to introduce the speaker for this evening or this afternoon or morning, depending on your location throughout the world. We have Kevin Klein who will be taking us through his Convince Me session and I'm going to leave him to introduce that himself in a short minute. What I will do first though is quickly just give you some information about the virtual chapter itself. There's been a recent leadership change in that the old leadership team that was there, they unfortunately had to go off and do other things and they've asked us to step up with some new leadership. Myself along with my co-leader Matan Youngman will now be leading this specific virtual chapter and we will be hosting a couple of events uh, in one in November, one in December and hopefully they will then be going on a monthly basis forward from that. We also have some other ideas that we're currently discussing around some thought leadership stuff and I will be making you aware of more information about that as we progress. So we're kind of richly on the, uh, it's now 5 p.m. in the UK and this is our start time for the session. I do have a bad cough so I'm not going to speak too long because uh, I don't want you guys to just hear me coughing in the background here. So if you do want more information about the professional development chapter, you can email us at the professional development email address. And I'm just going to quickly change the ownership of the presenter to show you the website and where you can find information about that. So let me just do that very quickly. And I'm going to go to the main page that we have. And in here, if you go to the About Us link, which I'm just going to bring up now, you'll see there's an About Us link and in there we do have the email address for this professional development chapter. So feel free to get in touch with us through that email address or through on Twitter, either myself or Matan, and we will be happy to ask, answer any questions around this virtual chapter itself. So we do have one more other session now lined up. This is on the 10th of December, and it's uh, Craig Purnell, who did a session at the last summit, and that is now listed on our website and we'll, the email invitations will be going out tomorrow, hopefully for this. Uh, again, it's at this time on the 10th of December, and I will send you all the information about that shortly. Just to give you a quick glimpse as to what that's going to be, it's the Professional Networking Toolbox, and this is going to be a great session by Craig, so hopefully you can join us for that on the 10th of December as well. And I'm now going to bring in and introduce Kevin. I was going to give him back the uh, presenter rights, one second. And I'm also going to unmute Kevin so he can actually talk to us as well. So Kevin, can you hear us at this time? Loud and clear. Excellent. How about, uh, my audio, is it coming through okay? I can hear you perfectly, Kevin. Thank you very much for joining us today. And it's a pleasure again to uh, kind of uh, be in touch with you. It's, it's, it was great to see you at the summit this year. Um, and I'm glad you're able to kind of sign up and help us present this first session as new leadership for this event. Or Always a pleasure, Neil. So, Kevin, I'm going to uh, be quiet now. I'm going to pass it over to you and uh, do enjoy. If there's anything, I will be taking Q&A sessions, and at some point I might kind of uh, look at those and, and pass those over to you, Kevin, uh, and interrupt you. But um, if any questions you do have, there's a Q&A session control in your session control and you can just type in any questions you have for Kevin and I will be able to relay those to Kevin during the session. So it's over to you my friend. All right, thank you. Hi everyone, thanks so much for for joining me today. Our session today is entitled Convince Me, Persuasion Techniques That Get Things Done and this is particularly targeted towards IT pros. You know, we as IT people, uh, if you watch the popular media, you know, you watch TV shows or movies, there are certain stereotypes about us, and uh, they're not always flattering. We're not always considered uh, to be the smoothest uh, in social settings and things like that. So um, one of the things that I had learned over the years, working a lot with sales teams, and pre-sales teams, and then also working a lot with the C-suite, you know, the top-level executives at huge organizations, uh, VPs and, and so forth, and, and the executive decision makers, that the skills that make you persuasive uh, 
are things that can be learned. And so a lot of IT people tend to think, oh, you know, uh, that's not me. I'm, I'm not a real social person. I'm a little more introverted than those, you know, the guys in sales. You know, they're, they're much more active and engaged than I am. And it, it's, just not, it's just not where I am. But what I have seen throughout my career is that, in fact, these are things that you can learn, just like you learned how to code just like you learned how to work with servers. And so why don't, we, uh, why don't we start to learn those things? As Neil had mentioned in his introduction, you know, there are a lot of, a, a lot of learning uh, opportunities for us if you're a member of the professional association. So the upcoming session about uh, networking. Uh, you should definitely attend that. Once we as IT people really embrace the more social side of our of our profession, we see not only that they uh, empirically have proven more successful careers, earn more money, get more promotions, have more opportunities, that sort of thing, but uh, these IT pros actually have more successful technology careers. What? How, how is that possible? Well, it turns out that's possible because many of the problems, in fact, some would say most of the problems that we experience as technologists are actually because of communication problems. Uh, they are not always technology problems. It's uh, interpersonal, team, deadlines, communication, stuff like that. And so really, uh, really interesting dynamic. And so we're going to dive into that just a little bit. Uh, as the screen shows there, I'm the Director of Engineering Services at SQL Century. And I've been involved in the uh, SQL Server world for a long time. I was uh, first an Oracle person in the late 80s and early 90s, and now a SQL Server person since before it was actually a Windows product. I was one of the founders and uh, original board of directors members for PASS, so uh, that's one way that a lot of people know me is that I was one of the founders of the organization. I'm really active online, so please do follow me at K.E. Klein on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, and also I have uh, websites at kevinekline.com and for the soft skill side of things tech, uh, like this particular session I have a website dedicated to soft skills for IT pros so please take advantage of that this slide deck is already posted on kevinekline.com and on slideshare.com but uh, as part of the virtual chapter organization you'll also be able to see the slides and the video afterwards all right, so uh, one quick commercial for the company I work for. We give away a lot of stuff. We are very interested in supporting the community. So if you do uh, much query tuning, for example, you might be interested in our very popular free Plan Explorer tool, which makes it easy to tune queries. And we like to say that this is so free that we don't even ask for an email address. We won't spam you. Uh, you won't get any kind of harassment or <laughs> anything like that. We give free query tuning advice at answers.sqlperformance.com. We actually have not just one, but now two ebooks that are regularly $10 in the Kindle bookstore. We'll send that to you for free if you're interested. You can email me at kekline.com or at our sales organization. Lots of training videos, query tuning videos, uh, things like that at sqlcentury.tv. And we have a great blog at SQLPerformance.com, all about hardcore tuning. And uh, I shouldn't say tuning, it's about performance. So it covers not just query tuning, but also server tuning and, and things like that. Hope you take advantage of that. All right, so let's jump in to the, the meat of this discussion. And it's going to have several uh, different main areas of discussion. As Neil mentioned, please feel free to type in any questions that you have as we go along. And as we have time, we'll, we'll try to get those answered. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is talk about some of the myths around persuasiveness, being a convincing, um, uh, presenting a convincing argument, not in the sense of being argumentative, but in the sense of uh, trying to ask for something and getting a positive response, uh, a proposal, if you will. Influence. How do we become influential? That's the sort of passive way that we can convince people to do things because we are influential, not because we've been invested with authority, 
but simply because people respect our opinion. And then we're going to spend more of our time on what we would call explicit appeals. These are literally us asking for something. And that's something that we often don't do as IT pros. We often kind of want to let the facts speak for themselves. So how do we actually go one step further and ask someone to do something to modify their behavior to change it in some way? All right, so let's, let's dispel a couple myths. Myths, and one of the first myths, and I think it's it's a profoundly widely held myth, is that uh, you know a person can be considered uh, as a natural born leader or a natural born uh, you know uh, extrovert, I guess you could say, and many people tend to think that uh, you know as IT people. We we do tend to be more introverted than the uh, than the wider and more general public, and so we tend to think of ourselves as not being the sort of persuasive and influential sort of person that you might see. But there's some really interesting empirical studies, you know, uh, scientifically driven, quantitatively driven studies that that tell us that these aren't truths. Uh, they are not universal. They're not really uh, what we think they are. They're myths. And one, of the, one example of that would be, let's say, the President of the United States of America. That seems like a fairly influential sort of person, right? You know, their decisions has an impact on a lot of, a lot of people and at many levels of, of life. And yet, when they study the personalities of many of the different uh, presidents of the United States, what they find actually is that the extroverts and introverts in these groups are pretty equally divided. It's not like 15% of the presidents are introverted and 85% are extroverted. A very equal number, it's almost proportion, it's almost you know one to one, are both introverted and extroverted. So we tend, our society tells us that we live in kind of a Tony Robbins world. If you're familiar with Tony Robbins, the kind of, um, uh, the, the kind of archetype, I guess you could say, for this really effusive, outgoing, extroverted personality. But in fact, really, really persuasive people and influential people aren't always extroverted. Um, they are often introverted. And that's one of the reasons for that is that introverted people also have another I word that goes along with kind of their their mindset, and that's called introspection. Um, you know, a, a lot of people joke about how extroverts will start talking before they even really know what they're going to say. You know, their mouth may be way ahead of their brain. Introverts rarely, rarely do that. In fact, um, uh, introverts are kind of noted for thinking about what it is they want to say before they ever say anything, and that's why extroverts get you know get a word in before they do, and so introverts when they do speak tend to have much more well thought out arguments. They're much more persuasive. They uh, in, in, incorporate a great many more um, elements of wisdom, I guess you could say, and so. What we see through studying different, very influential types of people, CEOs and uh, you know, well-known uh, military leaders, uh, well-known uh, political leaders, that many of the most effective ones are, in fact, not necessarily natural extroverts. And so these things that we think about as innate abilities, they're not, actually. What we see in the most influential people is that they are behaviors. They're not a trait, you know, like uh, like how tall you are, or what color hair you have, or what color eyes you have, or whether you uh, are naturally uh, project your voice when you speak. The way you project your voice when you speak is a behavior. That is something that you can modify and change. You can learn it, and you can affect it by conscious practice. And so, some very very introverted people are actually extremely persuasive, very uh, public facing. And I'll give you just a real quick example of that. Uh, in my case, I'm a little bit more on the extroverted side. And what that means is I'm, I'm energized when I talk to people. You know, so when Neil in the introduction mentioned, hey, it was great to see you at Summit, uh, 
For me, it was great to see Neil as well, and I enjoyed speaking with Neil. And afterwards, you know, I head back to the hotel, and I thought, wow, it was great seeing all my friends. I saw Neil, I saw Matan, I saw all these, uh, you know, uh, Mark Broadbent, I saw all these great people that I was really looking forward to seeing. That was wonderful. What a night. Introverted person, like my brother, who is a professor, uh, and is a very well-regarded professor, great lecturer, and very entertaining. Um, you know, he could go into a same environment like that, and people would be thrilled to see him. Never, ever think for one moment that he wasn't an extroverted person. But at the end of the day, when he goes home, what he would say is, I am so worn out. I need a little alone time so that I can recharge and, you know, get my uh, kind of psychic energy back. And so that's the key difference between introverts and extroverts. It's not an ability. Many introverts are exceptionally good performers or speakers or musicians, you know, in front of crowds. But what the big difference is, is that they are kind of, it, it takes energy out of them. Um, whereas an extrovert is energized by the, that encounter with a group of people. And so what's the difference between really, really influential introverts? Well, it's that they practice the behaviors that cause people to pay attention, to listen, to, to be interested in what they have to say. So there's two ways to do it. And if you're tr really, truly, strongly introverted, you're probably going to like the first half of our discussion today as opposed to the second half of our dis discussion. The first half of our discussion is about how we can build influence. And some people would call influence political capital, you know, our, our kind of bank role of assets in the, in the sphere of influencing other people. So the first half is about these five things that I have here on the screen. These are things that enable you, when you practice these behaviors, to be very, very influential, to express an opinion that people respect and want to know. You know, people will seek out your opinion. Even if they don't follow it, they will definitely seek it out. Uh, because you have influence. Um, the second half, which I'm going to try to manage our time as well as I can, this was originally a 75-minute session, so uh, it's a little bit tight for time, but the second half is how to make a direct appeal, how to actually try to convince somebody to do something a little bit different than um, what they had initially planned. But, you know, when we look at IT pros and we see all these different things that we can do that either build our credibility and influence or actually erode our credibility and influence, it's just a matter of learning to practice specific behaviors. You can be the sort of person who is, you know, not naturally inclined to spend a lot of time with other people. You need a little bit of alone time to, you know, to recharge your batteries. That, that doesn't mean that you can't be extremely influential. And one of the first things that, that I want to um, point out is that um, there's, there's a certain kind of, um, uh, there's a certain kind of transactional nature to the way that we build influence. And I, I like to call it the law of reciprocity. And, and so one of the things that happens when you look at these different, uh, you know, kind of uh, images that I have here, professionalism or edifying your team. Keep this idea in the back of your mind as we go through some of these different, um, different slides that are coming up in a few moments. So most of us are individual contributors. We're really good at technology. And, uh, you know, so we have built our career around being great coders, <laughs> you know. And, um, uh, that doesn't require us to be really good communicators. It doesn't require us to be really influential. Uh, and that is the first element of our credibility, is we do have to be technically competent. If we're not really good at the technology we were hired to work with, that's going to erode our competence. But once we've gotten past that particular hurdle, other things become really important, like how you give information, how you talk to people, how you listen to people. And again, going back over here to this law of reciprocity, if you are a great listener, it's really strange, but people will actually uh, begin to 
seek you out because they know you can listen well. You can ask the right sort of questions back. Um, and uh, uh, so it is something that they reciprocate. They want to see you listening to them because they know you do it so well. They're much more inclined to actually listen to you as well. Uh, and it's strange. A lot of times people who just ask a right couple question every now and then in a conversation, the impression that everyone else in that conversation they have of them is that they were the best conversationalist there, when in fact all they really did was ask some interesting and open and honest questions. So let's, let's dive in a little bit deeper into these. Now, I'm not going to actually read off all these bullet points. Um, I, I want you to know a couple kind of salient ideas off of these slides. And, uh, you know, as we move through each one of these, we will um, uh, we'll have a key takeaway or two for you on that. But the, the, the first thing here is that <clears throat> when we're technically competent, we can get our code written, you know, in the, you know uh, in, within the milestone, and we can, uh, uh, you know, be counted on to turn in good quality code or to keep our servers up and to keep them from crashing. Um, that's all well and good. But what will set you apart as the influential technologist on your team is this first point I have in bold there, is to have an opinion. Sometimes that opinion might even be no opinion. Now what? What does that mean? Well, um, so it's not on the slide, and people who unfortunately will just be picking up the slides uh, will not hear this, but here's the way to always have a winning opinion in technology situations. What you want to do is you want to spend a little time thinking about how your team, uh, what the shared and mutually agreed upon, even if they're unspoken, values of your team is. So if you work on a dev team and, and you've seen that your manager has chosen to maybe not implement the very best technology solution that we could because we have to get things out quickly all the time. We have to move fast. Well, you could kind of from that, you know, um, not really assume, but you could from that discern that speed of execution is one of our most important values on this team rather than, you know, quality, build quality. And so from that, you could say, if someone came along and said, you know, I wonder if we should upgrade to this newest version of Visual Studio. We don't really, or Telerik tools, or, you know, Component 1 tools, or something like that. And you could say, you don't know anything else at this point, but you could say, well, I've never looked at any of those tools yet, but I know based on our key values that we, del we prize speed of delivery. And because of that, if we had those tools, I know we could get this code cranked out much, much faster. Boom. People instantly say, wow, that's, that's an impressive opinion. They may not agree, but you will instantly get credit for having an opinion that is so valuable uh, and so well thought out. And all you did was kind of derive the question, uh, uh, kind of distill it back to the initial set of values that your, uh, um, uh, that your team has. Now, in some situations, you need to have backup. And that's the other thing that I see a lot of people do. So they'll, they'll, they may derive an opinion based on the shared values. They may even have, you know, relevant inf information, but they don't have any, you know, credible expertise their, themselves on the topic, and they haven't done any research to find out what other experts are saying. So that's, uh, that's another bit of persuasion that may, may be helpful for you to get, um, you know, a blog post that's written by an expert and have it ready in case somebody asks. Now, there's some other things you can do here about how to become even more influential than your peers. Just a quick word about this final bullet point. People will see that you care, uh, that you are really, really motivated because you care, not because uh, of some other issue, because your paycheck depends on it, but that you actually care. And again, that's the sort of thing that is really under the radar for most IT people, is those you know, kind of touchy-feely parts of it. If you show that you care and you exhibit uh, attitudes like ownership, you know, this is something I own. I'm going to make sure that it gets fixed. I'm going to make sure that it gets, you know, built to completion and in a good way. People reciprocate. So don't forget about that law of reciprocation. Now, communication, too. Um, this is an interesting uh, idea. One of the things that we definitely want to, to do is 
we want to communicate effectively. And one of the things that I see IT people do all the time, and it's a huge mistake, is that they don't know their audience. They don't realize they're talking to a manager who isn't currently technical. Maybe they were 20 years ago in their career. And so they, give, they hit them with every bit of detail uh, that there is to know about a situation. And so write this acronym down right here, BLUFF, bottom line up front. If someone who is non-technical asks you a question, don't give them a technical answer. Give them the bottom line and then say, do you need some more details? Do you need me to explain that? You know, if I'm on a dev team and I ask my team, what is the best way for us to, to build this code? And one uh, set of per persons on the team is arguing for an API, and another set of persons on the team is arguing for a thick client framework. I don't want them to hit me with all kinds of details about function calls and how they're going to do this in C Sharp. And th I want the business value of the particular decision. That's what I care about. And the one who tells me the answer in that way is probably going to be the one that influences me. A another thing that IT people don't do very much is they don't use analogies. And uh, the thing that's so great about analogies is they make really, really complex, challenging, kind of abstract ideas, kind of a real sort of way to express that and something that people can grasp immediately. So if a person on, in that particular example said, well, I think we should use an API because if we do that as opposed to a thick client, when we decide to go to the cloud, and we haven't decided it yet, but when we decide to go to the cloud, we don't actually have to do a lot of new coding. Um, well, that's, that's a great relatable example, but if they were to use an analogy of, okay, we're actually thinking about building a house, and we might have to build this house for cold weather, for warm weather, uh, for you know, any number of different things. Do we want to have to rebuild the house if, if we have to put it into a different climate, into that warm weather climate? I'm like, no, actually, we don't want to have to rebuild the house. He says, okay, that's what the API gives us. I'm like, aha, now I understand the business value of what you're talking about. Uh, another aspect, too, is that we tend to want to be remembered for being smart. And so that's not the point of communication. It's to, um, it's to make your point and then move on. Another thing that IT people forget about is that <laughs> even when you don't say anything, you, um, you're saying something. So uh, if you're on a group email and you're asked, everyone on the email is asked your opinion, a, a lot of times the default position is that um, if you don't respond, then you agree. And I would encourage everybody, uh, like I said on the previous slide, to not go with that assumption. Always make sure to express your opinion because every time you do, even if your opinion is, I don't really have an opinion, haven't thought about that yet, I'm focused on something else I consider to be really important. Um, by expressing the fact that you're engaged in the conversation, you actually earn a little, a little bit of credit that goes into your political capital account. Another thing that uh, uh, that is very difficult for IT people to do when we're talking about something that is related to technology is not actually solving the problem in technology. And this is something that the past board of directors in those early days, uh, when I was on the board of directors for PASS and when I was president, this is something that I constantly reminded the board of directors on. Uh, you know, I would say, look, team, we're not trying to figure out exactly how we're going to code this particular new feature on the website. We don't have to talk about whether we're going to do this or that or use this kind of code or that kind of code. What we're trying to decide is, is this the best way for this organization to expend its resources? That's our focus, was on that particular business topic. So IT people tend to get really detailed really fast. Remember, if you're in a conversation about something important that requires your influencing it one way or the other, keep things on that track and don't get detailed, don't get down to the weeds of the particular uh, problem that you're trying to solve and talk about, well, maybe we should use a merge statement instead of the update and insert stored procedure that we'd always used in the past. You don't want to do that. You want to stay focused on the business goal of the conversation. 
All right, so that's outbound communication, but inbound communication is similarly important. And one of the first things that I always encourage IT pros uh, is that we want to uh, we want to be seen as smart. And one of the things that happens when we're in a conversation is in order to be seen as smart, you have to have a really smart reply to something that is being discussed. And that means that you're actually taking your brain out of the conversation to think about what you're going to say and then to, uh, uh, to come back with some witty uh, repartee to the conversation. And I encourage, I encourage IT pros, be fully present in the conversation. Uh, there are a lot of times where I see that they didn't quite understand the uh, point of discussion, partly because they were already thinking about what they were going to say before the other person had kind of finished up, uh, you know, making their point. And so one of the things I've seen really successful IT pros do is that they stay fully engaged and they ask for more details. Um, they ask things like, "Now, is this your opinion, or is this a published, you know, uh, is this a pub published fact? Can it really, uh, can this uh, I/O subsystem really support that that number of transactions, or is that just a guesstimate based on what you saw in a five-minute demo in the exhibit hall?" Um, and also, another thing that IT people tend to do is they tend to use not open-ended questions, but closed-ended questions. Did you do this? Um, does it work the way we thought it would? Uh, is it a good solution? Those are all kind of yes or no things instead of what would happen to our process if we included this? Um, just be really, really careful about how you ask questions. And if you want to get better at asking open-ended questions, there's this old kind of rule of um, journalism. And it's called the, I think it's called the five W's, or maybe it's the four W's and H. So open-ended questions begin with who, what, where, when, how. You know, how are we going to incorporate this new learning into our system, our process? Uh, what would be the best way for us to do that? Those things, those open-ended questions engender more conversation and deeper thought. Whereas if I said, um, is this something we can put into our process? Well. The answer is probably yes or no. Uh, and if it's no, then that closes off the, the conversation and, and kind of causes the, the conversation to turn into more of an interrogation rather than an interaction. Now, when you're listening, you also want to make sure that you express that you are engaged. And this is especially important if you are in an um, international remote team sort of situation. If you're a listener in a situation like that, you want to let the person who is communicating know that you are paying attention. So you might want to say, uh-huh, or yes, or I understand as the conversation goes along. Another very important skill and something that you'll see a lot of presenters at conferences, for example, in the early days when I first started speaking at uh, TechEd, one of their requirements was that you repeat the question back to the uh, someone asking a question in the presentation, and ostensibly that was because we wanted to be able to catch, you know, pick it up on the recording of the session. But in fact, I found it to be much more valuable just because about half of the time I got their question wrong. Maybe there were some language barriers. English wasn't the, the questioner's first language, for example, and I misunderstood what they were saying. Uh, sometimes they didn't express it the way they thought they were, and so I said, so you're asking, would it be good to do X, Y, Z? And they might say, no, no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. I was asking whether that technique, uh, you know, had a, and then they explain exactly what they meant. The last thing I want to, this is a, a little bit of the uh, secret uh, ingredient in the communication sauce. And this word empathize has um, has kind of a loaded meaning. It's the sort of thing that a lot of people think, oh, I know what that means. Uh, empathize means to understand what, uh, what you know, um, to acknowledge and, and um, uh, put our arm around somebody when they're having kind of an emotionally hard time. And that's not quite right, actually. That's, that 
description that I gave is more akin to the word sympathize. And the problem with sympathy and sympathizing is that it implies like-mindedness. You feel the same way emotionally. And if you're a person who is uh, in an influential position, it implies you're going to do something about this. Right? Now, this is really dangerous ground for somebody who's a manager or a team lead. You know, if you're a manager and you say, oh, I know exactly how you feel, that person is really hard to work with. That implies you're going to do something about that person who's hard to work with. You don't want to do that. You know, and I always tease in the, in the context that this is something that you need to learn throughout life, uh, particularly if you're a man. Men tend not to be very good at empathizing. And what the word empathizing really means is to simply state that you understand how that person is feeling, to, uh, to kind of summarize it back and, and say, so this is how you're feeling. And I'll give you an example. When I was uh, er, you know, earlier in my career and I had a smaller team of um, less than a dozen people, and a couple of my employees were having some interpersonal conflict, and you know, one of them came into my office and they're like, I am so upset with this other coworker. I just don't know what to do. That you know, they're they're so difficult. They're so arrogant. There's so many problems. Now I could have said, Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Man, that person is so hard to work with because they were. They really were hard to work with. But that would in kind of implicate me in that I needed to do something about it. All I could do, and it was very effective, in fact, was to say, Wow, you know, you are really really frustrated by this. What's going on? Tell me more. And the research is really profound on this. What happens is when you acknowledge someone's feelings, they almost always take a deep breath in and release it. And with that release of breath, tensions go down. The emotions have de-escalated. The person says, yes, I'm so frustrated. I don't know what to do. I say, well, sit down. Let's talk about it. If, on the other hand, I didn't acknowledge her feelings, you know, and let's say this is in my home situation, I have a lot of daughters in the house, and if I said, oh, don't be that way, sweetheart, or don't feel that way, or, you know, why would you do that? If I deny her feelings, that, in fact, makes things worse. It ratchets up the emotional <laughs> situation, and uh, if you've been through, uh, you know, if you walked a mile in my shoes, then you know that by denying someone's feelings, you actually get implicated in the, and you're pulled in to whatever they're angry about. Now you're part of the problem. So it shows that you understand their feelings, and that's kind of the, the basis for being able to diffuse uh, uh, you know, uh, an emotionally laden situation. Uh, another quick secret I, I want to mention, too, is to understand the power of silence. If you practice these open-ended questions, it's really powerful to let it hang in the air when you've uh, asked a question of someone. People feel time slow down. You know, a quarter of a second or a half a second can feel like four or five seconds to a person who's been asked a, a question that's important, and they need to answer it. And so that is the ability to just you know let that. Why is it, team, that we are behind schedule? And you let it hang in the air. People really begin to feel. A need to answer that. If you get really good at this, it's it can be like a, a certain kind of uh, torture. <laughs> not that you want to use it in that way, but it can be a very productive way to get answers to questions just by not trying to jump in there and fill dead air. That's a very natural tendency for people to do. All right. Uh, again, some more slides about how to build your passive credibility with your team. One th thing is to recognize the value of teams and, um, and to actually brag on your team. Don't brag on yourself. Never, never talk about how you did a good job. I, I've been around a lot of IT pros who will say things like, well, you know, no one else could have known the answer to that problem. I'm the only one who could have figured it out. And they, they don't build their credibility when they do that. People actually are like, oh, I don't want to be around that person. It degrades their credibility. It erodes their credibility. Instead, what you want to say is this team was able to fix that problem really, really fast. Uh, and then you give a little bit of that uh, credibility that you deserve to everyone else. But what happens is the law of reciprocity. People remember that. And they want to pay it back to you. Uh, and so you become someone who uh, is well-regarded simply by giving away a little bit of 
the success that, that might go to you, or just recognizing the successes, other successes of the team that you had no part of and saying, wow, team, you, you did awesome. That really, really builds up credibility. Also, uh, leadership moments, being prepared for a clutch player moment, you know, when things are really bad. A DBA who not only knows how to recover, uh, you know, a, a crash database, but knows exactly how long it will take because they've done recovery testing. That DBA is the one that people say, wow, she really knows what she's doing. That is really impressive. That, that is the DBA that I am going to go to in the future for, you know, for some opinion. Uh, uh, another aspect, and I, this is one that has a lot of words, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about every detail on this, but one of the things that I, I want to kind of make as an overall point is that don't do things, minor things, that you feel like are little uh, to erode your credibility because they definitely tally up in the minds of the people that are around you. Uh, superiors, peers will notice that you don't dress as well as others. They will notice that you're not as timely as others. They will notice that uh, you know, you're not honest um, or that you don't really track to the goals that everyone else is tracking to. If you're in leadership and you are not engaged, uh, you're not really competent at what you're doing, those things in their mind build up very, very quickly and build this kind of negative political capital. Another thing I say, don't be that guy. Um, and the, this is the person I use as, as an example. Uh, IT people have a bad reputation for a certain kind of arrogance. Uh, you, know, um, you know, we roll our eyes when somebody doesn't know how to do something and you know, all they were asking was how to do something in Microsoft Word or Outlook. We're like, oh, all right, I'll help you fix that. Uh, what we find is that those people aren't respected. Uh, they aren't strong influencers, uh, particularly outside of their peer group. Instead, think of anyone who's asking you a technology question uh, as if it was your very first and earliest days in technology. Oh, you know, you probably had someone who was willing to help you. And remember that. Try to be like that, that person was who ha first helped you out. And when you're asked questions, don't respond with arrogance, but respond with that positive attitude of, oh, yeah, everybody has to learn this at some point. I did too. Here, let me help you. I'll show you. Just that kind of professionalism where you show that you care about people and you respect them as people will earn you enormous amounts of those uh, of those political capital points. Now, I talked a lot about passive influence. Um, you don't have to, hit, you know, hit a home run or you know, in every single category. But if you're uh, if you're pretty competent in three of these categories, you're doing quite well in three of them. You'll begin to build up quite a bit of uh, political capital, the ability to influence without really having ever tried to persuade people. Um, a, a common question that we get is, okay, I, I'm not really good at everything on this slide deck. I'm not really good at, let's say, team building. Uh, should I spend a lot of time you know, shoring up that weakness, or should I spend more time um, on strength, you know, so I'm really, really good at my communication skills, so I spend more time on that. And just to answer that question, to kind of head it off, what we see very frequently is that as long as you have a remedial level of competency, you know, you're not like a team destroyer, <laughs> you are at least minimally uh, uh, acceptable in terms of your professionalism and so forth, um, and people consider you fairly professional. Once you hit that kind of, you're not deficient level in each of those categories, work on your strengths. If you're a really good communicator, you can you know, present well and you can listen well, then spend your time getting exceptionally good at that. And that will have a multiplying effect on your uh, productivity as opposed to shoring up an area where you're not naturally good and you're a little bit weak. If you spend a lot of the equal amount of time working on those things, it's just the same as with athletes. If, if you're the best hitter on the team, but you spend all your time on being a, a super fast runner, and that's not uh, an area where you 
have some natural competencies, you'll never be, be as good as the best runners out there. Uh, so it, it, it tends to have an additive, you know, it adds 10 or 15 percent. Whereas if you work on what you're very, you are naturally really, really good at, um, then you will have a multiplying. So it's instead of 10 percent, it's now 100 um, percent greater productivity for you. And as I mentioned there, it's always great to find an ally who can help you in the areas where you're weak. They're naturally strong, you're naturally weak there, go with that. Have them help you out. Now, so that's kind of the first half, and we only have 20 minutes left, so I have to be quick about the last half here. Um, we want to persuade people by telling them stuff. You know, we want to, um, uh, we want to change their opinion. Now, this is what IT people do on a regular basis. We use the logical argument. We use the head appeal. We're going to give you facts. We're going to you know, maybe even bring a little math into it. I remember the first time I tried to talk my boss into uh, uh, sending me to some training that he hadn't initially planned to do. And so I kind of sat down with a sheet of paper. You know, I was in my mid-20s at the time, and I, I wrote out this kind of formula. I said, well, if you send me this, this week-long training, I think I'll get between 5 and 10 percent better uh, at what you have hired me to do. And over the course of the year, that is somewhere between 200 and 400 hours of added productivity. And at my billing rate, you know, you're going to earn three times back the amount of money uh, it would take to send me there in added productivity. Isn't that, isn't that great? And he wasn't persuaded at all. And I didn't realize that those logical arguments didn't apply in this case because he was not logically motivated. That wasn't what he was about in the least. And so there are other methods of appealing to people, you know, to, uh, to make a, uh, uh, an argument that we need to do something one way or another, emotional, cooperative, and so forth, that can be much more productive. So we kind of we break those three broader categories down into specific techniques you can use, uh, rational appeals, Intimidation, hmm, that sounds scary. Inspirational appeals and flattery, um, alliances, appealing up, calling in favors, consultation, all kinds of different things like that. In fact, though, these specific techniques fall into those three categories I told you about earlier. The rational appeal and intimidation are those head sort of appeals. The inspirational appeal and flattery, those are kind of the heart sort of appeals. And then alliances, consultations, uh, offering favors or calling in a favor, um, those are alliance-like um, appeals. And if you are a leader, here's, here's another thing to keep in mind, or you want to be a leader, and, and that is that influence, uh, you know, is like banking. As I said before, uh, you've got this bank account of political influence, political capital, and you can build up uh, the amount that uh, you have in that kind of virtual box, uh, you know, virtual banking account in the sky, and you can spend it from time to time. But in other ways, it's also like physics. And what I mean here is that um, in in physics, there are two major laws that 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 this correlates to. The first is the law of inertia. And the law of inertia says an object at rest tends to stay at rest unless acted upon by an external force. Conversely, there's the law of momentum, which says a law uh, says an object in motion tends to remain in motion unless acted upon by an external force. And it's the same way with uh, teams that you work with. Uh, one of the first times I ever used these sorts of uh, techniques uh, first time I was taught them, um, I used uh, these inspirational appeals, and I asked the team, I, you know, I, I, uh, we need to do X, Y, Z, and it's going to change the way we're perceived by the rest of the company. One of the things about what I was asking them when I uh, appealed to them was they were already doing it. Uh, just not in a very uh, concerted fashion, in a very cohesive fashion, but individually the te members of the team were already doing that thing. But I asked them to do it intentionally knowing that they were already doing it because when I saw them do it the next time, I got to congratulate them and thank them for doing that. 
and that built up a little bit of momentum. They saw now, oh, I'm being observed. Someone is measuring my progress, and I'm getting praise for that. So the next time I asked them to do something that they weren't already doing, we already had that forward momentum. And then when they completed that successfully, I praised them, I thanked them, and that built up more uh, momentum to get the next thing done. Conversely, you'll see teams who never seem to get much headway going. It's because they have this huge amount of inertia that they have to overcome to even get their first success or two knocked, uh, knocked out, you know, uh, completed. So let's dive into these a little bit more detail. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of time left, and I'd like to have at least five minutes for questions at the end. But So we're going to do head appeals. And so what's the difference between a rational appeal and intimidation? Well, intimidation is a loaded word, kind of like empathy was earlier. Rational appeal, I already gave you an example of that. When, you know, I was trying to convince my boss to spend you know, a couple grand to send me to, um, on a trip to a conference to learn some stuff. Intimidation in our world, we most commonly see used by salespeople who are trying to convince us that we need to buy some software. And usually intimidation doesn't take the form of putting someone in a headlock and demanding their milk money. Um, what it does is it says the universe is going to get you. you. You will hear salespeople all the time use a form of intimidation called FUD, F-U-D, fear uncertainty and doubt. And so they'll say, well, if you don't buy this industry leading software that uh, you know gives you the, the fastest, most reliable backups imaginable, how will you know if your backups are good? Uh, I just don't know what will happen when your backups finally fail because you're not using this software. So you'd be like, wow, yeah, you're right. Uh, I guess the universe might get me if I don't have the very best kind of software. Uh, available for it. A couple quick things about logical head appeals. They work great. These rational appeals work great when your audience is rational. And that's the way they like, like to evaluate facts. And so if you provide them with good facts and maybe even a good analysis, such as a SWOT analysis, uh, look that up on Wikipedia if you've never seen it before. This stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. And so when you provide a really good um, analysis and you also make it clear what's in it for me, this WIFM, um, what's in it for that manager, then they will, uh, they will be much more likely to buy on to it. If, if you take a look at the full slide deck, download it from the website, you'll see that I've got a full u a business case in there, a full kind of example of how to make a pitch uh, using this technique and how to explicitly follow up in a, in a way that will give you that forward momentum so that the next time you ask, it's even more likely that you'll be uh, responded to positively. Some of the common mistakes, like I was telling about you in the earlier uh, slides, is too much detail. Uh, not setting the big picture and not making sure that it is something that aligns with what that business leader that you're making the appeal to, or maybe, you know, maybe it's your spouse. It doesn't align with their goals. And so if it doesn't align with their goals, why are they going to buy into what you're asking in the first place? Another thing that we would see all the time on the board of directors at PASS is some director would have something he, he or she wanted to do, but they hadn't talked to anybody else about it. And so they make this big proposal to spend a huge boatload of money, but they haven't even checked to see if anybody else thought it was a good idea. So whenever you're making any kind of appeal, but uh, especially with rational appeals, is do take time to ask people you trust what they think of your proposal uh, and the way you framed it. Emotional, hard appeals are different. And again, there's kind of a, 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 a negative and a positive way to do this. The inspirational appeal versus flattery. Now, flattery can actually work, too. Um, for example, if you're not sincere about it. If you are sincere about the flattery, that can engender some goodwill and some reciprocity on the part of the people who are listening to you. Uh, how and when do inspirational appeals work? Basically what you do in an inspirational appeal is you appeal to the person's better selves. Instead of saying to your dev team, team, we are going to miss these uh, deadlines that we have coming up, so everybody needs to work five hours extra a week or five hours extra a day 
in order to make that deadline based on the amount of productivity that we've measured from each of you in the past. That's a very logical way to say. An inspirational appeal might be, you know, team, you are the smartest people I've ever worked with. I know that this is not a challenge for you. All it means is that we need to spend enough time to actually turn that incredible smarts that you have into real world code. And everybody's like, yeah, I am incredibly smart. That's my better self, right? I haven't told them that. But what I've said is we are motivated by how smart we are. And our value uh, as a team is that our you know, software is delivered on time and within budget and, and so forth. So you make your pitch to them based on the values and what it is they aspire to be. Again, this is the sort of thing that when done well can actually have really, really positive momentum. When it's abused or insincere, that's when it will backfire. And a good example of that, I have a friend who actually uh, tried to persuade one of her managers <clears throat> to change the way that they did setup and, and configuration on servers. And the manager would never agree to it because that manager, as far as that manager knew, the only metric they were being measured on was how quickly the servers were deployed. Later on, when this friend of mine found out that the manager was, you know, was ambitious and, and was very, very um, concerned about how they were perceived by the other managers, she, she changed her approach. Instead of using the, the rational appeal of saying, hey, if you let me change the way we uh, deploy our servers, we'll have better uptime and fewer support calls. She changed her appeal saying, if you let me change the way we update our servers, we'll get over this, uh, we'll get over this perception problem that our team has. And the manager, who was very concerned with how they were perceived, said, what do you mean perform uh, a perception problem? And she said, well, you know, the, uh, the, the other managers know that our servers don't, uh, uh, you know, they don't have as uh, smooth of a rollout and they have more support problems and so forth. So if we change it, then we'll be able to, you know, fix those particular problems. And, and the manager said, well, get started on that right away. So something she had been asking for many, many times in the past and never getting because she used an, a, a rational appeal was instantly accepted when she used an inspirational or uh, you know, a, an emotions-based appeal. <clears throat> the final way to build and ask for influence is through kind of cooperative efforts. Things like alliances, consultations, or offering a favor or calling in a favor. And one of the things that's really good about this is um, people do this all the time, naturally. You know, they, they look for people who can um, who can help them out, who naturally have similar interests. And so they try to build uh, rapport and drive for the same sort of goals. Another thing that I mentioned is that IT people love to be recognized for being smart. And so whenever you ask for a person's opinion, you are in fact acknowledging that their opinion has value and by extension that they're smart. So when you ask someone, hey, do you have a couple minutes to give me an idea how you might handle X, Y, Z? And they say, yeah, sure. They're actually saying, well, thank you for recognizing that I'm smart. But recognize that there's a transactional nature there. You have to be willing to give back. And you also have to be willing to actually act on that ad advice from time to time. There are some other ways to make direct appeals that are more problematic, in particular, going up the hierarchy and, you know, I guess you could say like two kids in the back of the car, you know, you go, Mom, he's touching me. That is really problematic. And this is one you should only use in certain situations. It can cause problems. Um, again, with these cooperative appeals, you, you have to be careful not to overuse it. You have to reciprocate. It is a transactional sort of thing. All right, so let's wrap up. We don't have too much time left, um, and I want to make sure that we do have some time for questions. Hopefully, I've dispelled, dispelled a few myths for you. We can, as introverts, be very, very influential, and also recognize that the so-called natural-born leader, all it is is a set of predefined behaviors that people are carrying out, whether they're introverted or extroverted. 
you can be seen. People will look at you and think, how did that person, you know, they must be a natural born leader. And in fact, all you're doing is practicing some of the techniques that I talked about before. Things like building your technical credibility, being uh, an expressive communicator, uh, an active listener, you know, that you apply professionalism and team building techniques to the way you conduct yourself. And then the three sorts of appeals to persuade through direct, uh, you know, direct persuasion. I want to change someone's mind. So I'm going to use the head, I'm going to use the heart, and I'm going to use the hands, depending on what's going to work best with the different people I work with. All right, so a couple uh, bullet points here, which somehow or another I <laughs> managed to mess up. Um, I really like the CCL, the Center for Creative Leadership. Great leadership training there. That's where I got a lot of my leadership training. Tech, Tech Republic also has some really good blogs there. Of course, this virtual chapter from SQL Pass. And then my own uh, website dedicated to professional development for IT pros. Hope you'll take a, a look at those resources as well. As well. And one last slide while uh, we take some questions. Neil, um, are there any questions waiting in the queue? So thanks, Kevin. Uh, we do have one question that's come in. And the question is, say the boss is looking only at short distance rather than on the long distance. In this case, how to tell him we need to change the direction? Mm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that's <clears throat> that's really tough in a uh, in a situation like that is, um, and with bad bosses, it's a very very common thing that um, the people who attend training, you know, people who go to leadership training or uh, you know um, team management training, a lot of times they're they have some self awareness, and so they're not actually a really bad boss because they know they need to get better. It seems like the bad bosses are the ones who never can even consider that they could be better, <laughs> you know? And so, um, you know, I'll hear people all the time say, oh, I wish I could get my boss into a, a class, you know, like this so that they could learn how to, to lead the team. And uh, so, Knowing as little as I do about the situation, it sounds like this particular boss is probably someone who thinks they're great, uh, or at least adequate, and has no questions that uh, that what they do is going to be adequate and fine and, and great for the team. So it's really really hard to, you know, change the direction of a of a manager or a boss who is fundamentally a bad manager or boss because they, they just don't see that they are that sort of person. Um, some, there are some different techniques you can try. Sometimes that manager or boss has a respected peer, uh, someone that they respect and look up to, and you're not going to go to that respected peer and ask them to change your boss's mind. Um, what you might do, uh, uh, or maybe a respected subordinate, someone who's worked for that boss for a long time, but ask them their opinion on how can I change this boss's mind? What is it that has worked in the past you know, for them to stop looking at the, the short rather than the long term? Uh, there are other things that you can do that actually may open up a, a, a better dialogue too. Uh, rather than saying, boss, you need to change. Uh, we need to take a long-term view rather than the short-term view you might turn it into a question and say, um, you know, if, if you're able to have a conversation with this boss that's, you know, that's fairly open and fairly friendly, you might say, why is it that we always take the short, uh, the short term answer when it hurts us in the long term? When if we spent, instead of six weeks, you know, doing this program, we took eight weeks to finish this particular program but we did it right so that we could repeat the process successfully much, much faster in the future. And, you know, we'd get a much better long-term payoff. Why is it that we always choose the short term? And then the boss might answer honestly and say, look, I'm under so much pressure from my bosses that there's no other way to do it. Now you have insight into what the real issue is. Why are we getting pressure from the top-level bosses? Maybe there's something we can do to persuade them 
you know, your, your boss probably already, in a question like that, the short-term boss might simply be responding to other pressures that you're not aware of. And once you can talk about um, solutions to their problems, then they begin to act on what you're talking about. Great question and answer from you, Kevin. I have two uh, questions. We'll see if we can maybe just uh, finish with these very quickly. So the first question is, any suggestions or books for NLP techniques to be helpful? Uh, I don't know that abbreviation. NLP. So NLP, that's the uh, Neuristic Language Programming Techniques, which Ooh. is kind of programming the mind and, and that. So, um, You know, I... I don't remember the exact names. Uh, if you'll check in the slide notes, I do have some references to uh, some of the uh, neurological studies that uh, have shown us a lot about how people learn, a lot about um, how they lead, and that is one thing that is kind of cool about being, uh, you know, a technologist or a leader in the 21st century is they can actually put people under an MRI and see what their brain is doing. Uh, when they make certain kinds of decisions or perform certain kinds of work. So there is a lot of neurological um, data that back up uh, uh, many of the recommendations, and I do have some footnotes of that in the slide, but I don't remember the names right off the top of my head. Okay. Um, and the next one I had uh, any which will other be questions? the last one here now. Sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Okay, the only other one I have now would be, how would you manage a situation where a direct manager practices protectivism? They withhold information and training budgets for themselves. Hmm. Ah, very interesting. Apart from running away from them as fast as possible, but uh, right. I'll, let, I'll pass that <laughs> one to you. <laughs> well, and you bring up a good point, Neil, too. Uh, IT is a high-demand business these days, and... I have a much lower tolerance for being mistreated by management than I, than I might have had uh, a decade ago. So you don't have to put up with really horrible managers. There's a lot of work out there for skilled IT people. That's the first thing. Uh, sometimes it's easier to find a better job than it is to make a really bad place into a better place. Um, the other thing, too, is to characterize what's going on in terms of, uh, of the team. And so bad managers often don't realize that they are evaluated on the productivity and accomplishments of their team, not on their personal accomplishments, particularly if they came up from the technology side, because we're so used to being evaluated as an individual contributor. And so um, sometimes if we just, uh, you know, uh, bring up uh, one of these discussions um, in terms of how effective how is the morale of the team? How is the productivity of the team? And you say, well, you know, the team is just really demoralized and they don't believe that there's any, um, uh, you know, care or support for them from management. Then, you know, that manager might realize, oh, they're talking about me. Uh, a lot of times, like I uh, responded to in answer to uh, the first question, many poor managers lack self-awareness. Um, and they may not be intentionally evil, they're just ignorant. And <clears throat> so it's hard to figure out, you have to know that particular manager to be able to broach a topic in a way that doesn't come across as an attack. Um, but uh, it's the sort of thing that uh, if you can somehow penetrate that ignorance and make them aware that the, the way um, that this team sees their behavior, it demoralizes everyone, then that leads them to think, okay, what do I need to do to fix that? And you can then make suggestions. Well, may I make a suggestion? Maybe you can allow the team to decide how something is going to be done, how the training budget, for example, might be distributed. Um, you know, we'd love to have a subscription to something like the Safari Books Online rather than you spending all of the money to go to a class. Everybody on the team can benefit from books online, or everybody can benefit from Pluralsight. Um, so it's one of those things, like our most difficult technology questions, where it depends. 
right? Um, you have to kind of look at that boss, find out what motivates them, and then use one of those three direct appeals, uh, whether it's going to be a logical one, if they're logically minded people, an emotional one, if, it's, if they're emotionally minded, or maybe a, a cooperative one based on, hey, this other team says they want to do some stuff around training. Can we join them? Uh, we'd really like to do that. It'll make our teams better individually and together. And so there's, based on what you know of that person, that's how you have to make a decision as to which, which appeal you will use. Again, very insightful answer there from you, Kevin. Um, so we've run out of time for questions and uh, kind of for the session. So I do really want to thank Kevin very much for an awesome session today. And I kind of a, it's one that kind of that, that touches uh, kind of root of my heart as well, kind of trying to get better at what I do and also kind of trying to, you know, just work out how to kind of work better with others and not just necessarily to kind of get what I want, but basically to kind of get, get a better what the team needs as well. So thank you very much for that. We do have a, another session scheduled on the 10th of December. I'm just going to um, bring over the, the ownership now of the screen, just to kind of mm -hmm. show you the screen very once more. Uh, let me just do that. And hopefully you guys can see this registration uh, screen up there. So if you go to the pass site, you'll be able to get to the professional development website from there, or you can go directly to the link uh, that's going to be an email that will be sent out shortly. You'll be able to sign up for the next session, which is on the 10th of December, again, the same hour, 5 to 6 p.m. GMT, and we have the professional networking toolbox by Craig. So um, I'm going to end the session now. Kevin, thank you very, very much. It's been awesome uh, to have you here today. Always a pleasure, Neil. Thank you. Thank you.